Good morning and welcome to Gautami Virakon from the Natural History Museum of London, who is a botanist specializing in lichens uh, and probably other plants such as fungi. Uh, it's very, very difficult in the modern day world to find botanists, even though botany is so important, particularly from a taxonomical point of view. Most people seem to be working on dinosaurs or paleontology or zoology. So botany is actually a very, very precious subject that has that has got a lot of background. That has got a lot of background interest, but actually to find representatives to talk about botany, particularly in the Sri Lankan context, is extremely difficult. So we're very, very privileged to have Gautami Virakun in front of you, in front of us. So Gautami, I will just start um, now. Um, now, how long have you been working in the museum, and what sort of job are you are you engaged in at the moment? So Rajit, when it comes to my current position, I took over this position on 4th of June, 2018. So yes. since then, I, um, I'm um, carrying on the responsibilities of this position as a senior curator of the lichens and slime mold. Yes. At the Natural History Museum, a Department of Life Sciences and a Division Cryptogamy. So, uh, but uh, NHM has um, been my home to my lichenological studies uh, since 2009, because uh, when I was a PhD student, uh, 2009 was the first year that I stepped into the NHM um, to study the collection with my supervisor, uh, uh, Patricia Wilsley. So, um, and then I went to USA to conduct uh, postdoctoral research and then um, applied to this position in 2018 and um, came back to NHM. Yes. Um, now, uh, cryptogamy, that's a very interesting uh, subject. And I understand that you're also working on slime molds. Now, I would say that we know even less about slime molds uh, than about lichens. Uh, do you, I don't really want to get dragged into too much about slime molds, but do you actually look at slime molds in Sri Lanka as well? So occasionally I see slime molds, but you know that mainly when it comes to my interest that I'm more, more a lichen hunter, lichen explorer. Yes. So, but uh, when I'm looking at lichens in Sri Lankan forest and also other South and South, uh, South Asian and Southeast Asian forest, I come across uh, uh, slime molds. But I think uh, more or less, I see more slime molds in European temperate zone than the tropical zone. Yes. Um, and presumably you did your PhD on, on lichens? Yes, uh, so that although my PhD go as PhD in biology, so it is specifically about lichen, so lichenology. So I studied taxonomy, uh, ecology, and distribution of um, lichens uh, in Knuckles Mountain region under my yes. PhD title. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Um, now, Sri Lanka has been, um, has, has had a bit of a head start in Southeast Asia when it comes to biodiversity studies because uh, because the British and many other, uh, well, the Dutch and the British uh, were, were involved in documenting some of the biodiversity, uh, at least in a scientific context. Um, has this helped lichenology or has lichenology, uh, maybe it wasn't really dealt with quite to the same extent as could have been possible. So is there a huge amount of work to be done? So when it comes to Sri Lanka uh, um, and also South Asia, huge, massive amount of work needs to be done yes. in the cryptogamic uh, um, sciences. So including lichen, fungi, mosses, ferns, um, algae, everything, Rajit, yes. Um, and uh, focusing Sri Lanka, I, I think that uh, um, not due attention uh, is paid to any of these groups, even in recent, uh, recent exploration, uh, you know, that uh, Sri Lankan research is blooming, has started blooming since uh, late 70s, but the attention given to these uh, sciences are very, very less. 
I would like to contextualize what we mean by cryptogamy because in the good old days, because I have studied some botany, cryptogams were normally uh, higher plants. I mean, when everybody talks about cryptograms, they normally talked about um, um, mosses and ferns. Those are the sorts of cryptograms that most people were, were, were thinking about, mosses and ferns. But lichens are even less studied, aren't they? Yes, lichens are one of the le uh, least studied groups in Sri Lanka. So, but uh, ferns and mosses, if anybody thinks they belongs to higher plants, that is absolutely wrong. Okay. Because they, they don't have, uh, the main thing is they don't have roots. Yes. Like any other plants, higher plants, uh, or we call uh, an angiosperms, okay. And uh, lichens also, it is just a thallus. Uh, it's kind of a, a communal uh, organism made with many different types of uh, um, organism getting involved, um, but no roots, no uh, tish, um, absorbing tissues or anything is found in that. Okay, context. well, I'm just interested in pressing this point before going further. So when we are talking about traditional cryptogamy that, it, that was about mosses and ferns, to what extent are lichens plants I mean, are there a combination of mosses and fungi? Is that is that the symbiosis? So lichens are, are a mini ecosystem, actually, um, because uh, main partner on a lichen community is a fungus or several fungi um, interacting with uh, algae uh, or cyanobacteria, or sometimes both of them. And then modern sciences, so that recent research uh, carried on says us that uh, other than the main fun fungus uh, in this uh, uh, mutual relationship, that they, there are other fungi like uh, yeast and endolichenic fungi and bacteria, so many other organisms are interacting in this community. So I would call a lichen as a mini ecosystem. It is completely different from a moss or a fern. Uh, uh, although that uh, mosses and ferns have uh, you know, their own capacity to uh, absorb uh, sunlight and uh, make their own food through the photosynthesis. Lichen, of course, the, the fungal partner cannot uh, make any food. Uh, instead, that uh, fungal partner use the uh, modified algae partner to make uh, the food for the lichen, the entire community, and also uh, in where well, that in some instances when there are cyanobacteria involved in this uh, community uh, it is not photosynthesis it is chemical synthesis then okay so it is a complicated organism uh, different from ferns or mosses so uh, to deal with the uh, lay people as it were uh, lichens are at least popularly a symbiosis between algae and fungi uh, normally, algae are associated with uh, water or aquatic habitats. Do lichens need to have water or aquatic ha habitats? How does the algal component deal with the lack of water? So it is like this, so that uh, we find the same algal component that is in the lichenized con condition, um, living freely or non-lichenized condition in, in these kind of moist habitats. Mm -hmm. But when when the same algae comes to uh, join with the fungi uh, in lichenized condition, that physiology, um, biology of this algae uh, get adapted to the lichenized uh, condition. So you don't really need a lot of moisture uh, for the lichens to grow. It needs moisture, but doesn't need so much moisture uh, for the algae partner as it is in the free living condition. So Maybe, lichens can yeah. thrive in deserts, in near hot springs, uh, many, uh, you know, um, uh, tropical conditions, um, arid conditions, and uh, they can survive under very less amount of water, humidity conditions. And when they have uh, uh, enough, uh, that as an example, if during the rainy season, lichen, some of the lichens are capable of absorbing 300 of, uh, percent of water than its body size compared to body size. 
So lichen doesn't need so much of water like free living algae. It's a kind of matrix. Yeah, it is a kind of matrix so that, you know, survival, survival adaptation to your immediate environment, I would call. And they can also grow on rocks, uh, rather not just not just the bark of trees, but also on rocks. Yeah, lichens are found on rocks, soil, and also uh, in epiphilic condition, like, you know, that uh, if you go to rain, Singaraja rainforest, uh, so you would see that hundreds of different lichens growing on plant leaves, broad, broad plant leaves, not necessarily they need a tree branch or a bark to grow. And also lichens can grow on many man-made surfaces like glass, concrete, timber, rubber, uh, roof tiles, everything. And also lichens are found almost every habitat all around the world. Well, when the lichens are growing on plant leaves, do they hurt the plant in some way? For example, like uh, some kind of uh, parasitic organism or is it, is, it, uh, is it benign? Is it a benign interaction? No, lichens are never parasitic. Lichens are never parasitic. Either they grow on plant uh, leaves or bark or branches or roots or anywhere because uh, lichen produce a lot of unique chemical compounds within the talus of the lichen, but they are not uh, parasitic or they are not secreted to kill a plant or damage a plant tissue or anything because although lichen sit on the plant um, parts, they are just sitting there that they just need a house, but they don't absorb anything or secrete anything back to the plant. But, but when they're, if they're on a plant leaf, aren't they going to be inhibiting or getting in the way of the plant absorbing sunlight, photosynthesis? Yes, that, that is a, that is a, that's a true point. They can cut down the amount of sunlight falls on the plant leaf and, you know, kind of disturb the photosynthesis, but I think it is a very minute case. And presumably the lichens also offer food to lots of invertebrates. I mean, they're the source of food to many, many small animals or that kind of uh, various sorts of other kinds of biodiversity that might rely on them. Yes, definitely. So, you know, that uh, in Sri Lanka, I have come across, uh, you know, many occasions where small uh, mollusk uh, uh, graze on lichens, and then ants and many other insects, they eat parts of lichens, they suck chemicals from the lichen talus. And also, um, Rajit, uh, many other animals um, use lichens uh, as a hiding place, like for biomimicry, that you uh, will come across a lot of insects, frogs, um, and mollusks, you know, exactly look like the lichens they are associated with. And sometimes they use it to trap other animals as their food source, especially spiders. And some uh, arthropods, they lie on the lichens, they lay eggs on the lichens. So for protection and also other animals like squirrels and birds, they use lichens for their nesting material as a bedding material, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, so Gautami, uh, one of our uh, listeners might be uh, somebody called Suresh P. Benjamin, who's a specialist on spiders, and I think you're very familiar with certain spiders that are camouflaged to, uh, on like, like, well, how do you say, lichenoid surfaces or something like that. Yes. Yes, yes. So that uh, I have come across hundreds of uh, um, occasions, examples, uh, especially in uh, dry mix uh, forest and also forests like Singraja. Yes. Yeah, we have captured many photographs uh, that of these uh, spiders and other insects that um, use lichens for their biomimicry. And so you would say that they are actually very, very important for the overall ecology of the forests, uh, not just in providing food and hiding places, but maybe having engagements with the higher plants as well, interactions with the higher plants, maybe in some kind yeah. of... Useful yes, way. Rajit, because uh, lichens are one of the first organisms to start life in a barren environment, you know, that oh, that completely, you know, uh, cleared environment. So they go there and they uh, capture um, uh, humidity or water vapor and then start uh, um, developing uh, micro soil there, and then bryophytes, mosses, uh, liverworts, and hornworts can 
accommodate uh, in that same uh, niche. And then you eventually see uh, micro ferns uh, coming into that niche and then higher ferns coming into that. That is how that any barren environment uh, start uh, uh, the path to succession. And also lichen, mosses and ferns are on the very uh, bottom of any uh, food web of the world. So actually uh, like cryptograms are the creators of the, the uh, you know, any habitat for other gymnosperms and angiosperms to come in. So, um, go to me. Uh, how do these lichens get there in the first place? How do they propagate themselves? Is it like, is it like fungal spores or something? Yes. Yeah, so, fungal partner is the dominant partner in lichen community, and also uh, fungal partner has the ability uh, to uh, start the next generation because. Uh, Reproduction is not done uh, by algae uh, when it is in a lichen condition. So fungus makes spores which um, start the next generation of the lichen. Um, and mainly these fungal spores are carried by wind, water, or sometimes uh, several locations by animals as well. Once the fungal spore has started germinating, at some point it will create some kind of association with the algal component. Now, is the algal, algal component part of the fungal spore or does the algal component join in later on so in some other way? No, uh, algal component is actually captured by the fungus after it develops its own mycelium. So it waits until the correct uh, partner, algal partner or the cyanobacterial a partner is available in that particular micro niche, and then it captures it and, uh, and get embedded into its mycelium. Actually, fungi, that lichenized fungi, uh, is one of the best uh, farmers that we uh, see in natural world. Mm. The, yeah, they, they, they are kind of farming algae or cyanobacteria in the, in the mycelium. Uh, because they want uh, the algae and cyanobacteria to provide food for them. So just for clarification as well, and I'm sure that this is fascinating for our listeners, go to me. Um, the fungus, the, the algae doesn't have to be species specific to the fungus. It could be some kind of algae that can actually work with that particular fungus. It's not necessarily some, I mean, when we're talking about a lichen, it's not talking about an exact species of algae working with a certain species of fungus, it could be a similar species of algae, possibly. Yes, it, it, you don't have a specific uh, uh, choice in a particular niche. So whatever the suitable algae or the cyanobacteria that is available immediately near your mycelium that is uh, captured by the fungus, actually, it is not uh, specific. So, so you can you can say, see that same fungus, we'll say that fungus A capturing many different types of algae. So, uh, so um, it is not specific at all. So go to me, I'm curious to know, I mean, and without getting into details, how do we describe these lichens in terms of species? Do we describe them as species or species complexes? How do we actually name them when actually the, the fungus is one species and the algae is another species? Uh, Rajit, so uh, so far all the lichens that are known, so we know about 21,000 lichens in the whole world now, all of them got their taxonomic name or that nomenclature of lichen is based on the fungus, the dominant partner there. Yes. So that uh, algae or the cyanobacteria or other microorganisms are not considered when give, uh, giving a name to a lichen. And um, that's extremely interesting. Um, now, presumably, even though lichens are capable of growing in arid conditions, the, 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 the greatest diversity must be in the wet zone forests, go to me. Yes, so that out of the 21,000 lichens we know, the majority, about 16 to 17,000, are found in tropical zone, but there are cosmopolitan lichens that are found in both tropical and temperate conditions as well, and also Arctic conditions. So they are um, superpower lichens, which can grow in any uh, um, 
any habitat or any region of the world, but majority of lichens, what we know out of these 21,000 are tropical lichens. So in some ways, um, because of the way that they can, they can spread themselves, you know, for example, using spores, they must be far more cosmopolitan. So how does that, uh, uh, how, you know, I mean, how does that affect the endemicity of the lichens? I would imagine that in that case, there might not be so many endemic species of lichens. So that, uh, good question, Rajit, uh, because uh, this um, new species that we describe uh, in Sri Lanka, um, during our research, um, um, actually, I would personally very hesitant to call them endemics. Mm. So because that many uh, lichens that were uh, considered or documented or published as endemics in South India, and also majority of no Northern Indian lichens, although we don't have that sort of altitude, uh, you know, highest altitude in Sri Lanka is 2,600 meters. So, but uh, um, the, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating that uh, we are recording them in Sri Lanka. Yes. Okay. So I think it is because either they are overlooked or lack of exploration, you know, lack of knowledge we have. And another good example, Cora, one of the Latin American species, actually, uh, that first we thought Cora is a genus, not a species, genus that is endemic to South America. But the yes. first Cora was recorded from Sri Lanka as a new species. It's a new species um, from Sri Lanka a couple of years ago. Yes. So we found it uh, on one of the rocky substrate uh, near Sinaraj rainforest. So not only species that I would not call endemic, but also uh, once it comes to the generic level, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them endemic. It is because they are not still explored enough to call them endemics. Yes. Now, can you name any, any uh, species of lichen that come to mind? I mean, roughly, I mean, out of these 21,000 species, roughly how many lichens? I know that we might not be able to put a number on it, but maybe Sri Lanka has got thousands of species of lichens. Yes, yeah, so that uh, the current uh, um, provisional list we are providing that is to be published in very near future, uh, 2020 red list of Sri Lanka, document 100 and 877 lichens on them, on 800, it, yes. 877. Uh, however, Rajit, that unpublished data, what I'm um, compiling, uh, I know about 1,200 species for Sri Lanka. Yes. But uh, the estimation number of lichens for Sri Lanka is between 3,000 to 4,000. That's higher enough. than, yeah, the number higher than flowering plants that are known to Sri Lanka. But when it comes to fungi, it could be more than that. Yes, yes. More than that in the country. Because uh, on provisional checklist uh, that is to be published on 2020, uh, red list is 1,139 for the country, but I know it could exceed more than 5,000 to 7,000 fungi in Sri Lanka. So, so go to me. So I that mean, is the situation we have. Yes, go to me. I know that you have written at least one one volume about the lichens of Sri Lanka, including popular publications. You've done one thing for for Dilma. Dilma, you've done a Dilma book about lichens. Um, mm -hmm. So at least we have somebody who's working on lichens, which is, I think, a miracle, uh, especially in an Asian context. What about fungal fungi? Are there are there any? I mean, are there more people working on fungi in Sri Lanka, or are you also working on fungi in Sri Lanka, Gautami? So it, it's uh, Rajit. I would like to make a correction there. So I'm not the only person that is working on Sri Lankan lichens. So Dr. Udeni Jailal, senior lecturer of Sabragamo University. Uh, he secured his PhD um, also in lichenology and uh, he is senior to me. He is the first person to uh, secure a PhD in lichenology. And then uh, uh, Dr. Pera Munage uh, did the uh, lichen related PhD as the second holder in lichenology or related to lichenology. And uh, Dr. Cyril Vijay Sundar um, is one of the leading collaborative scientists who I always work with. And then uh, uh, 
Professor Priyani Paramagama, Dr. Renuka Aptanayake from Kennedy University, they work mainly on uh, associated endolichenic fungi and uh, chemical products of endolichenic fungi. So it's not me that we are a group of people, uh, few people as a group who works on lichens. But when it comes to fungi uh, uh, research in Sri Lanka, so we, we have a lot more people working on fungi of Sri Lanka uh, and including some of our uh, colleagues and students who are at, at the moment in other foreign countries. They do a lot of research in Sri Lanka, collaborating with the Sri Lankan academics. So uh, I think more people are working on fungi than working on lichens. That's very, very good to know. I've, I've hardly come across many books about fungi in Sri Lanka, let alone ly lichens. I've only come across like one mushroom book, uh, but hopefully this is an area that will develop in the future, Gautami. Sure, sure, that we have high hopes that uh, um, especially uh, lichenized fungi or the lichens and non-lichenized fungi, the mushroom, toadstools and everything, uh, will be more and more explored and documented before they are completely disappeared from the country. Yeah. Um, so go to me. Uh, you were referred to me by uh, your colleague in the museum. Well, I think she's still a colleague in the museum, Dina Zad Rahim, who is working on snails. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever worked together in the forest hunting for lichens while she's hunting for snails? You're looking for lichens? Yes. Yeah, so we have uh, explored uh, many. Uh, forested and unforested uh, commercial plantations together, um, looking at lichens and uh, mollusks together. And then uh, we have come across many occasions that how uh, her mollusks are grazing my lichens. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, and it was fun. Um, so uh, yes, we have uh, gone on many, many uh, trips that uh, both academic and fun trips to look at lichens and mollusks together. So my experience of exploring the knuckles is that it's extremely difficult even to make progress through the undergrowth uh, in the heat, for example, and also there are hundreds and hundreds of leeches. So how do you normally deal with this situation of like working, working on a hot day and going through the forests? I mean, how, how do you manage to cope with the environmental conditions and the leeches? Uh, so Rajit, uh, um, because uh, uh, that the correct word, I think, because I'm crazy about lichens. So most of the time, I don't see leeches crawling on my body. <laughs> that's a big problem. <laughs> yes, that's a challenge. So especially when you go to um, uh, high elevation, about, uh, about 900 meters in uh, Knuckles range and also other mountain range, yeah. In Sri Lanka, leeches are a big problem. So these crawly animals, so that my trick on them is apply so much of Siddha Lepa. Right. You know, that our local is that before, before you, medicine, Siddha Lepa. Yes. So you applied before you... Before oh, you all over my standing. shoes and my yes. trousers, yes. everywhere. Yes. yes, yes. And hopefully that's a that's a good enough deterrent. Now, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, Gautami, that you have been working for. I mean, presumably you still do lots of field trips to Sri Lanka. So not last year and this year, it is due to this, you know, horrible pandemic situation that is global. Yes. But uh, um, we have an active project to monitor lichens um, in Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, and Bhutan, and also from June to 2021, that Pakistan will also um, will be added to our research list or country list. So. We are traveling all over South Asia, looking at lichens, not only Sri Lanka. And then uh, we are establishing a permanent monitoring plots in Sri Lanka in several places, including one permanent plot in one of the Dilma uh, uh, Queensberry plantation to monitor the uh, change of lichen communities uh, um, to uh, monitor how air pollution, actually nitrogen, is affecting the lichen communities because lichens are one of the best bioindicators we have in the world. Yes. So um, I am very active in the field, um, um, including Sri Lankan habitats as well. Yes. 
Um, so uh, you you're obviously working with lots of um, lots of international workers uh, on both lichen and fungi, and it's a wonderful thing to me that you are working in the whole. Of, I mean that your work seems to apply to most of South Asia, uh, incorporating even wonderful places like Bhutan, which has got a huge amount of its rainforests protected. Uh, um, what about the level? Uh, there is the convention on by by uh, the the convention on biological diversity is is, uh, is uh, applies to Sri Lanka and actually it's a very very good method of uh, of uh, enhancing uh, the research uh, in Sri Lanka alongside international collaboration. Do you get? Um, uh, are there any limitations in the interpretation of the CBD or do you find that maybe things are improving and that it is possible to work in this international context? Uh, particularly when it comes to work in Sri Lanka? Um, so, uh, Convention of Biological Diversity has three main goals, Rajiv, that we have to understand that conservation of biodiversity in any part of the world, and then sustainable use of its components and fair and equi uh, equitable share of genetic resources. So, if you follow the guidelines and regulation of any, any a country, that I'm, I'm talking uh, from my own experience and uh, collaborate to uh, legal channels and uh, get uh, the collection permits and export permits when it especially come to lichens because I work in a natural history museum, I need to bring my specimens that I collect in any local country to study them further because most of the, the countries that I work, they don't have infrastructure or laboratory conditions, what I need to study them further. And then um, if you fo follow the guidelines, regulations, uh, uh, protocols, I don't think CBD is a big challenge. Oh. And, and also uh, in my institution, we strictly follow the regulations of CBD and Nagoya. Yes. But so far, the, the research I have done during the last decade or last 12 years has never uh, got me into to, you know, corner position or whole situation because of these CBD convention regulations. So when it comes to Sri Lanka, I always uh, collaborate or do my research through senior professors and doctors in the country in through the universities or other research institutions like National Institute of Fundamental Studies. Um, so um, if you do it method, uh, following the methodology that is in the Sri Lankan forest tree and the wildlife departments, it has never been a barrier to me. Yes. So, so yes. and also I respect uh, rules and regulations of Convention of Biodiversity and Nagoya Protocol because they are established to protect, you know, especially underdeveloped mm -hmm. uh, countries' uh, biological resources, because you don't want Sri Lanka is a hotspot. You don't want anybody to come and over exploit anything. Yes. You don't want anybody to, you know, take the, the valuable genetic resources, which should be fairly and equitably shared between Sri Lankans and the foreign community. So I'm a very protective of, as a Sri Lankan, I'm a Sri Lankan national, nationalist. So I'm a very protective about the biological diversity and sustainable resources in our country. So Gautami, uh, there is, under these circumstances, there is opportunity in the future, if things are done well, for more international collaboration and for the knowledge about the biodiversity of cryptogams in Sri Lanka to increase. Of course, Rajit, because, uh, I have collaborative projects, um, including, you know, other South Asian countries with Sri Lanka. So Peradeni University is the center for that. And NIFS is the center for that. We, we work with India, Nepal, Bhutan, and hopefully Pakistan from June. And then I have collaborative projects developed with Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, and China. So, so they, these are fantastic research opportunities. And also when it comes to lichens, a very small group of uh, people are working internationally and I always need their expertise. Mm. 
and my colleagues have come to Sri Lanka. They have collected lichens with us in Sri Lanka. They have studied uh, uh, and conducted the workshops and other research po forums in Sri Lanka. We never have any problem. If you do yeah. it through the correct channel, following the guidelines, it is never a challenge, problem. So go to me. Sri Lanka uh, has an open yeah. door, but you have to to follow the rules and regulations in Sri Lanka. Yes. Gautami, there are going to be quite a few people uh, listening to this podcast, and I'm quite happy to say, actually, that it's not going to be too many because this is not necessarily the most popular of subjects. Uh, but if people uh, don't hear what you're saying very clearly and they want to uh, uh, get more information about studying lichens and uh, or pursuing botanical interests in Sri Lanka, maybe they can contact the Department of Cry Cryptograms in the Natural History Museum. Is, are you open to, to, to getting uh, inquiries? Yes, so that, uh, yes, so that uh, lots of my foreign colleagues um, um, that we, we interact with, we communicate with each other very much. And uh, so that within Lycanological uh, International Group, uh, so they know that if they want to do anything, uh, if, if they are interested to do any research in Sri Lanka, especially, they know um, they can contact me at any time. And also that uh, um, I, I, I welcome anybody who wants to, you know, get to know about lichens or get to know about Sri Lankan lichens. So they are most welcome to contact me at any time. Yes. Yeah. So go to me. I want to talk. Uh, take a more broader perspective now. Uh, I can remember one of my one of, one of my most wonderful memories is uh, from uh, the early 1970s when uh, we were having a wonderful picnic uh, by the riverside at uh, uh, Kitulgala, and at that time mm -hmm. I can remember there was a lot of logging going on. Uh, although I mean, obviously my recollections are a bit dim, but I'm aware that from a very very uh, early period in the 70s and long before that. The lowland rainforests of Sri Lanka have been subjected to lots and lots of logging, yes. mm -hmm. and um, and um, I mean it is arguably the case, uh, according to uh, Tilo Hoffman, who I have talked to, that there has been more biodiversity destruction in Sri Lanka since independence compared to before independence. Uh, I mean it's an arguable thing, and the fact of the matter is that the world population has uh, probably more than doubled since I was born. Uh, I mean, this is a kind of situation that is unprecedented in the history of the world, because in the 20th century alone, the human population has doubled several times, uh, several times uh, over and over again, which has never happened in, in the past. So it is, it is totally inevitable that the environment is going to be under the huge amount of, uh, uh, well, risk of disappearing. I mean, it has disappeared to a large extent and it's carrying on disappearing. It's a perpetual story. Um, th so what I'm trying to say is that, uh, in the 70s, the Singharaj rainforest was disappearing, and then fortunately some action was taken to halt it. Uh, mm -hmm. And now, because of COVID, and uh, again, there's a huge, there's a there's a, a big need for more agriculture, more food production uh, for the local for local consumption and for the export uh, for export industries. So, given that there's this kind of inevitable progression of total destruction carrying on. Um, should we should we be so upset about about this this kind of this destruction carrying on uh, because isn't it isn't it like part of the furniture that it's been happening for the long time Rajit, it is a very sad and such an unfortunate situation so um, actually you and i and 21 million of our sri lankan population is now living in an era to see this happening every day. Mm. So I think uh, from 1948, so I was born in 1970s and you could be the same. So that things we saw uh, from our childhood age to date is that how many things have disappeared even from your own home garden in mm. Sri Lanka. So this is a very unfortunate situation that, you know, that um, um, I don't like to talk about the politics, but when it comes to this thing, I think um, we can't, uh, that how responsible our politicians since the, the, the post-independent would have taken much more effective action even today, even mm -hmm. today. 
So the, the rate of destruction that happened from 1948, from the day that we got independence to date, is unbelievable. Mm. Unbelievable. And also most of these things that we lost and losing today will never be there. Mm. If anybody thinks that, okay, that if we uh, stop cut down forest or killing elephants or killing uh, leopards, three examples, okay? Mm. Will recover in ten years, fifty years, or hundred years. Mm. You're fooling yourself mm. because they are irreversible. You mm. can't turn back the clock, Raji. Mm. We have passed that threshold in many of the the the, the forest uh, forestry forest and wild uh, life parks. Um, we have surpassed that threshold. Actually, most of the things will never go back to its original state now. And you know that a uh, few months ago that this big hahu about the clearing of uh, um, other state forest in Sri Lanka. Yeah. What a massive destruction we are doing. Yes. Anybody can say that, okay, that it is few hundred acres in this village, uh, another few hundred acres in that wildlife sanctuary or few hundred uh, acres in Singaraja forest. But when you gather all these few hundred acres, it becomes thousands of acres per day now. Yes, yes, per day. yes. I mean, I, I was... So we uh, are living among these examples, Rajiv. So Gautami, look, I want to put a, put a different spin on this because uh, I'm going to be having a discussion soon, hopefully with uh, Rohan Petyagoda about uh, if foreigners are more interested in Sri Lankan bio biodiversity than uh, locals. And it's very clear to me from talking to you that this is not, not necessarily the case because you are a local person who is passionate about the wildlife. It's not that the locals do not care. So there are many, many other people like you who are very, very concerned about uh, biodiversity direct, uh, destruction in Sri Lanka right now. And hopefully that, that level of passion will could lead to some kind of amelioration of the situation. Um, um, so I think that our... Uh, um, local naturalists, um, educated uh, people about the natural destruction happening in Sri Lanka. So they are taking a gigantic uh, action against these things. So, but I don't know when it comes to, uh, you know, the Sri Lankan uh, management sec uh, uh, section, who are supposed to uh, take care of these uh, problems and also so political heads who are responsible uh, in these scenarios, whether they are correctly heard or whether they are whether they have enough knowledge or natural or scientific background to understand. So how irresponsible they they are acting. So, so, yeah. so I, I, the before that foreigners, uh, that yes, that a lot of other people from around the world is so concerned about what is happening in Sri Lanka, but um, at the same time, our own Sri Lankans um, are raising their voice. But I don't think that uh, people who are responsible are hearing them or they behave like they're deaf and blind? Yes, but go to me. I think you'll, you'll appreciate from your work in the whole of Asia that Sri Lanka is not necessarily the worst country when it comes to environmental destruction. This is a huge problem, particularly in countries like Indonesia with even more biodiversity. But um, Rajit, I want to stop you there. Yes. So, um, yes, that massive destruction is happening in Indonesia or Malaysia compared to Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. but Think about the limited land cover we have. Mm. So it is, you know, 6,500 uh, square kilometers, what we have as an island. Mm. Compared to in, uh, Indonesia or Malaysia, it's a very small piece of mm. land. Mm. Yeah. So that all our flagship species like elephants, leopards, including small organisms like lichens and bryophytes, have to sit on this small land piece with the 21 
million population in the country. Yes. You know that elephants have to roam in the same um, landmass where the people are having their, uh, you know, uh, chena cultivations. Yeah. So I think when it comes to, so I don't like personally comparing our problems with other countries like Indonesia or Malaysia. Yes, yes. Okay, because yes. the resources we have are completely different from these big countries compared to Brazil or Indonesia or something. Yes, yes. And, the, and this is our own problem within our own household. Yes. So we have to find solution within yes. our own household. Yes, yes. So go to me. Um, we don't really have too much time remaining. Uh, I think that the only thing we can do is to be optimistic uh, personally to, to try to change anything for the better. Um, what do you think should change or how do you think things can improve in the future? <laughs> so I think uh, um, it should come from the head of the state to, to the common people actually. So the, the whole system needs to change politically and also the management roles and the legislation should be. I don't think that we have a powerful legal um, framework or the, even the legal framework we have, it is active or it can be acti activated under these conditions. I am not criticizing anybody, but it is everybody's job. It is everybody's responsibility, you, me, and everybody. Yes. So go to me. I mean, there's always been political limitations in a country like Sri Lanka. What about the private sector and other organizations? I mean, you are you you've got a research station in a Dilma tea plantation. Do you think that the private organizations have a chance to lobby the instruments of state to improve things as well? Or any yes. other organizations? Yes, yes. A state, private, and also governmental, all these bodies should come in hand in hand to conserve the biodiversity. And also it must be a joint effort, Rajit, because it is not one man's job or show. So we all have to come together to, to conserve our biodiversity without any more delay. Yes. Without any more further delay. So go to me, botany is such a, a wide, uh, wide ranging subject, particularly in the context of Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, there's such a wonderful history about orchids and about trees. Um, so, I mean, I, I wish I could, I could carry on talking to you a, a little bit longer about botany. So maybe I will have that chance again, or maybe find some other botanists to uh, have lo long, longer discussions about the fascinating story about the botany of Sri Lanka. But for the moment, I thank you for your time. And, uh, and we're keeping our fingers crossed and monitoring the situation. And I, I hope that uh, some of the listeners uh, will find this of interest and that, um, and that uh, there'll be future um, um, optimistic developments in the future. Thank you very much. Thank Do you have you, any Rajiv. final Thank words? You. Any final words go, go to me? Yes, yeah, so that my final word is understand how important and how valuable the biological resources in the country, not only lichens or elephants or leopards, but altogether the biodiversity and take necessary action today, okay. not tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, goodbye.